Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is desperately trying to move away from his past. He's once again apologizing to blackface, this time to a totally different audience. The mainstream media is losing their minds over Andrew Scheer's proposal to close the loophole in the Safe Third Country Agreement and end illegal border crossers. And True North has a huge victory in the courts. Hi, I'm Candace Malcolm, and welcome to another week of the podcast, the show This Week in Fake News, where we go through the biggest stories in the news and criticize the mainstream media for all the things that they deserve to be criticized for. They're biased, they're torqued, they're liberal, uh, pro-liberal cheerleading all the time, and uh, the fact that they just don't want any diversity in the media landscape. So let's jump right into it. I will just start off right off the bat. It's been a great week for True North. We had a huge victory in the course. I'm sure you've seen it, or if you haven't, I'll just quickly explain what happened uh, last week. Um, my journalist Andrew Lawton, who's been trying to cover the Liberal campaign unsuccessfully for the last two weeks, well, he's been successful to us, but the Liberals won't let him on the campaign bus. They won't let him ask questions of the Prime Minister. We applied to go to the official leaders' debates, which happened this past week. Uh, the French language one was last night, Thursday night, and the English one was earlier in the week on Monday. So we applied through the official channels, which was this deba debates commission that the government created. It was supposed to be an arm's length organization, kind of working in, uh, in, in association with the parliamentary press gallery in Ottawa. And they made the decision that True North was not uh, an accredited journalist, just like the Trudeau Liberals. So we thought that was unfair. They delivered this decision to us at the 11th hour, one business day before the debate, with just a one-line explanation saying that you uh, can't participate because your organization engages in advocacy. And again, it just didn't seem right. The email rejecting True North came from the gov a Government of Canada email address, but this was supposed to be a completely separate body that was making this decision. So True North decided to fight back. We believe in freedom of the press. We believe in freedom of speech. Yeah, we're not a mainstream establishment media organization. I think that's what makes us more interesting. We, we're we independent, we're digital. Uh, we come from an editorially more conservative perspective than the mainstream media. And so we felt like we were really being discriminated against. We decided to go to court. We hired a lawyer, we crowdfunded. And believe it or not, you know, most people didn't think we had a chance. We didn't get a lot of support. I didn't get a lot of messages from my colleagues in the mainstream media saying good luck or anything like that. You know, maybe just the odd message here or there. Sue Ann Levy in the Toronto Sun wrote a nice little article about it. But other than that, not a lot of support. Well, that doesn't matter because a judge ruled that we were right, that we had been treated unfairly, that the government's decision to bar us would cause irreparable harm to our organization because you know they shouldn't be the ones who decide who is and who isn't a journalist. And you don't want to get into the into the, down that I think really murky waters of just saying that the government is the one who's in charge of determining who is and who isn't a journalist. So thank goodness justice prevailed. A federal judge really saw our perspective and not only ruled in favor, gave us the emergency injunction to allow Andrew Lawton to go report and go ask questions of the prime minister, um, but he also awarded costs. So we, uh, the, the, the government had to um, not only pay for their lawyers, but reimburse us for ours. So it was a huge, huge victory for a small organization. And again, I just wanna say, thank you so much to anyone, everyone who made it possible. The only reason that we were able to successfully go to court in the first place is because we had the support of so many Canadians. Everyone who chipped in, opened their wallets and chipped in a few dollars, thank you so much. Everyone who sent messages of support, everyone who helped share our stories on social media, Thank you to everyone. Uh, it really felt like it wasn't just True North in court that day fighting for our press freedom, but we were fighting for a basic right uh, of all Canadians. So that, that felt good. And then our, our journalist, Sandra Lawton, was able to ask a couple of really stellar questions to the Prime Minister, things that we had been trying to get uh, the Prime Minister's office, uh, the Liberal campaign, to answer. They, they, they won't answer our questions in private, which is why we have to go and ask them publicly. And so uh, I was really pleased with the performance performance that Andrew Lawton did in asking questions, getting to the front of the line and making sure that he was able to do that. So um, thank you again to everyone who supported us. Now let's jump right into the news of the week. I want to start with this clip that was circulating around uh, social media. Um, it's pretty cringeworthy. So I'll, I'll just play it in, in full right here. Soleil and Solaris, do you want to stand up and ask a question? Why did you paint your face brown? 
Ooh. Um, it was something I shouldn't have done because it hurt people. Um, it's not something that uh, you, you should do. Uh, and that is something that I learned. I didn't know it back then, but I know it now. And I'm sorry I hurt people. But did you paint your note in your hands, Brad? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it was the wrong thing to do. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack here. What did we just see? Um, you know, first of all, the thing that strikes me about this is that it's obviously on a set. It's on a set of a television show. That this is scripted. This isn't just sort of like the prime minister is doing a photo op and all of a sudden these little girls surprise him with a question. And he acts like he's surprised, like genuinely surprised when he gets this question. Ooh. But he obviously knew it was coming. This was a scripted show. Trudeau was a guest on this uh, new show that's on Facebook Watch uh, called New Mom Who Dis. And he, again, you know, he, he would have known exactly what was coming. I watched the whole clip. Um, is cringeworthy from start to finish. This this was obviously the most cringeworthy part, but you know, before that you, you, we see Trudeau just really openly flirting with this mom host lady um, who, who you know, they, they, they lean in and kiss each other. They're, they're just openly flirting. She's asking him about his body. It's, it's, it's just gross, the, the fact that the prime minister is kind of engaging in this, in this kind of behavior. But I, I really do think that the worst part about it is that they brought in two little children, two adorable little black children, to ask the prime minister a very, very serious, heated question. I'm, I'm sorry, those little girls were used as political props. They don't know, little, little children that age, they don't know about politics. Anytime you see children, especially that age, I think they look like they're about five or six, um, maybe even younger, uh, asking political questions or involved in political questions or at rallies or holding signs. I don't care whether it's on the liberal side or the conservative side. I just find it distasteful. I don't think that you should use your children as political props. I don't think that you should get them to parrot your talking points. So these little girls, I mean, I have a niece that's around this age and you know from my experiences is that if you know she's left to ask a question on her own devices she's not going to ask a political question in a million years she's going to ask what's your favorite color uh, or who's your favorite character on frozen she's not going to ask you about your political history and your history of wearing a racist trope so again just using the kids and getting them involved was just so so painful to watch and you know interestingly even when trudeau is on a stage set clearly all you know very contrived he still didn't answer the question the little girl asked why did you wear blackface why did you paint your face and he didn't say why he just said it was wrong i didn't know it was wrong at the time but i do now it was wrong uh that's not answering the question she asked you why you did it why did you do it uh and again trudeau can't even ask answer a question to small children and it took small children to ask the question that the mainstream media would not ask so there's just so many avenues uh, that you can criticize here and i think one of the most interesting elements is the fact that None of the, like, I didn't see this circulated through the mainstream media in Canada. I don't know if they aired it on CBC or Global or CTV. I highly doubt it. The reason that it was, you know, it has over a million views on Twitter is because American conservative journalists found it and started criticizing it and mocking it and just absolutely shaming Trudeau over it. And so that's how everyone saw it on social media was because of these prominent American conservative journalists. And so again, like what does this say about the landscape of the Canadian media that our journalists won't even share an interesting newsworthy video that embarrasses a prime minister because they like him too much? because they don't want him to look bad, because they don't want to talk about blackface anymore. I mean, it, it's shameful that, again, we had to wait and get this kind of news from American journalists and that the Canadians just don't want to talk about it. I think this was a big fail all around by Trudeau. I think obviously he was just trying to appeal to a demographic that he's desperately trying to hold on to, which is moms, suburban moms. And, you know, he, he thought by putting on his humble face and apologizing to these two adorable little girls um, that, you know, Canadians would forgive him, which and maybe they will. Maybe his, his base of supporters will. Uh, maybe undecided voters will. But this just seemed like such a desperate plea. And also it brought blackface back into the conversation. Like, like the media had moved on. The media has completely stopped asking Justin Trudeau about his blackface racist past. They've stopped digging. 
they've stopped asking any question about his past. And when other journalists ask questions about the past, uh, they shame them. So the mainstream media doesn't want to talk about Trudeau's past anymore, doesn't want to talk about blackface. So it seemed, you know, a little curious that Trudeau himself was putting it back into the realm of discussion, back into the, you know, media, because again, he'd moved on. So I, I felt like this was a fail on multiple ends from Trudeau and from the Liberal War Room. Uh, let's move on. Uh, I want to talk about uh, Andrew Scheer. He was down in Quebec on Thursday at Roxham Road, which is the place where about 95% of all illegal border crossings take place. And he announced his policy on cracking down on illegal immigrants, cracking down on illegal border crossers um, by closing a loophole in the Safe Third Country Agreement. That is the bilateral agreement between the uh, United States and Canada that prevents what people call asylum shopping. So if you're a true refugee and you're fleeing persecution or you're fleeing a war zone or you're fleeing violence, you're not going to have the luxury of getting to pick and choose which country you want to go to, right? Like if you're so desperate to get out and just to get somewhere safe, you're not going to like land in Pennsylvania or land in New York and say, you know what? Uh, I heard that things are better up in Canada, so I'm just going to make my way up there in the same way as, you know, if you land in uh, on the Mediterranean and you get to Italy and then you say, well, wait a minute, Italy isn't as generous as some of the other European countries, so I'm going to make my way up to Germany or the UK. They try to discourage that as well. So they call it asylum shopping. That's what the, the Safe Third Country Agreement is meant to prevent. Um, so if a migrant lands in, when they come to North America, if they land in Canada, they have to make their asylum claim in Canada. If they land in the U.S., they have to make their claim in U.S. Uh, there's a couple of exceptions, like if you have family members in one of the other countries, they permit you to, to go to the other one. Um, but because we have this agreement, if a migrant arrives at the border, at the official border crossing between Canada and the U.S. and tries to make an asylum claim, they'll get rejected and they'll be turned back and they'll go into detention in the United States. Um, that's why they cross at the illegal pl places because there's no one to stop them. And well, th there are RCMP officers, but they, d they don't actually stop them. They allow them to come in. And then the migrant makes an asylum claim and they're permitted to stay in Canada. So it's, it's a whole loophole. It's a bunch of people taking advantage of uh, generosity and finding a loophole in the laws. So Andrew Scheer was down at the Roxham Road and he announced his policy, which would be to renegotiate the Safe Third Country Agreement and to make it apply so that the illegal border crossers couldn't cross the border. Uh, the mainstream media doesn't like that. <laughs> the mainstream media doesn't want Andrew Scheer to talk about being tough on immigration because it makes Justin Trudeau look bad. It makes it look like he hasn't been doing his job. Well, that's completely true. Uh, one of the, Trudeau's weakest issues is immigration and border crossings. A lot of can Canadians are concerned about the integrity of our immigration system, that people are taking advantage and breaking the rules and that is where Trudeau is weak. And so Trudeau, uh, so Scheer is stepping in and trying to, you know, give Canadians another option on this position. And so of course the mainstream media loses their minds. So this is from CBC, Aaron Weary, who is one of the biggest Justin Trudeau fanboys and cheerleaders. He just has a new book out uh, that does just that. So his piece is called Fear at the Border, Why Andrew Scheer is Talking About Gangs and Migrants Now. The conservative leader plans to end illegal border crossings, who <laughs> raises some awkward questions. I like how he uses the word illegal in scare quotes, as if it's not illegal. When I've been to Roxham Road, there's a huge sign that says it is illegal to cross here. So you really don't need the scare quotes when something is very clearly illegal. So Weary uh, goes, <clears throat> kind of crazy against Cheer talking about how um, he's just basically fear-mongering and he, here he says Cheer's contention isn't born out of any available public opinion data. He's talking about how Canadians have lost confidence in Canada's immigration system and he says it isn't born out of any available data and then he links to his own article that's talking about something totally different. Uh, this is not true. Public opinion has routinely showed that Canadians don't feel that Justin Trudeau is capable of responding to the crisis at the border. Public opinion has shown that most Canadians believe that there is a crisis at the border and most Canadians believe that um, Canada takes in too many asylum seekers and that we are too, that we're too generous to illegal uh, border crossers essentially. Um, but for whatever reason, 
<laughs> Weary says that isn't the case and tries to pretend that this is just not a big deal. Uh, there's a whole bunch of liberal talking points in here. Um, one of the things that the liberals insist that is not true is that the influx has declined. So they say that, yeah, sure, there's still a lot of people crossing the border illegally, but not as many as previous years. And so that's supposed to be some kind of a victory for them. And so Aaron, Le Aaron Weary says it right here, the influx has not ceased, but the rate has declined. Through August of this year, the RCMP have intercepted 10,343 asylum seekers, 4,000 fewer than the first eight months of 2018. Uh, again, that's not true. I had a piece last month in the Toronto Sun going through and debunking this statement that the Liberals like to say that the rate has declined. Okay, 2017 was the record year when it came to asylum seekers. Uh, way more than the previous years, three times higher than the average under the Harper government. 2017 was a big year and there was a lot of media coverage about it, a lot of journalists speculating and saying it was all because of Donald Trump. Um, but then 2018 came and there was actually even more. It broke the record again and by that point the media had moved on. They didn't want to talk about it because it made Justin Trudeau look bad. Uh, 2019, you barely hear anything about it in the media, like barely anything. Well, it's actually the numbers this this year are set to be even higher than last year. The halfway mark of this year, Canada had received uh, 26,860 asylum seekers, and that is more than at the halfway mark of either 2018 or 2017. So it's just not true that the rate has declined. There's still a lot of people crossing the border. And one of the other things that a lot of journalists do, here's another similar story. This one's from Global. It says that the, um, <laughs> I love this, Experts say Shear's plan to close the border loophole doomed to failure. Of course, the experts always always agree with the liberals. Um, so again, they're just saying that um, Shear's plan is not possible. And this is this is something that you, I also see that um, a conservative will make up a conservative politician will make a suggestion or make a policy proposal. And then there'll be like this deliberate misinterpretation of what they're saying, a deliberate misreading of the policy. And then they debunk that deliberate misreading. It's such a straw man tactic. It's like, instead of going against what she was actually saying, they create this other thing that they're pretending that he's saying, and then they take that down because it's easier. So that's, that's what's happening here. Uh, we have an expert, a law professor, who says any plan to scrap the loophole and safe third country agreement with the United States is doomed to failure. She says that expanding the agreement to cover the entire border, border is nonsensical because Canada does not have the resource to enforce a type of mass securitization of the border, nor is this type of strategy effective. Well, that's not what we're saying. Okay, in the case of the illegal border crossings between the US and Canada, there's one location where 95% of all crossings happen. So why don't we focus on that one part? We're not talking about the entire border. We're not talking about securitization of the entire border. We're talking about one location where we can crack down on 95%. And, you know, as soon as you say that, they pretend like, oh, well, then if you're going to do it to one part of the border, you have to do it to the entire part of the border. And that's just not a, a, a realistic strategy. It's like, yeah, but that's not what he said. And that's not what we're doing. We're talking about one very specific location where you could easily um, stop people and turn them away. And you could easily just not allow people to cross at Roxham Road, put up a fence, put up a wall. That's not what Shear is saying, but that's what I'm saying. That's what I think that they should do. Um, people would get the message like, okay, Canada is actually cracking down on illegal border crossings. This whole gig is up and you know, we'll have to figure out another place to go or thing to do, or if we want to go to Canada, we'll have to go through the legal means. Um, in, instead of taking, you know, the argument at face value, these experts and these liberal journalists and liberal partisans uh, pretend that you have to address the entire border, which is just totally not true. All right, just looked at the time. We're running a little long here, so I am going to leave it at that. I just want to once again reiterate, uh, thank you so much to everyone who supported us this week. It was a big week for True North, and we're really happy with the way things have gone. So thank you so much for everyone who supported our cause, either through supportive messages um, or by financially helping us out. We really, really appreciate that. So thank you so much for tuning in. Thanks for listening this week. Uh, please share this video, like this video, and like our page. All right, take care. Have a good weekend, everyone.